Perfect. Thank you. In like three, oh, yeah, like three seconds. <laughs> Great. Um, all right, so I'm going to kick us off as folks are still streaming in because I want to be respectful of our panelists' time. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining our Transit Safety for All um, talk tonight. We have a group of really esteemed, wonderful panelists, and I'm thrilled um, to have them here. Um, if you uh, don't mind, please introduce yourself in the chat. Um, also, after we, we do some questions, Q&A with the panelists, we'll um, have time for questions from the audience. So feel free to um, ask your question in the Q&A function. You can also do it in the chat and I'll pay attention to that. Um, and we'll pass those along. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, my name is Zach Deitch Gross. I'm the advocacy director with San Francisco Transit Riders. We are the Bay Area's only member-based organization lifting up the voices of riders across the city. Um, and this wonderful event, Transit Safety for All, is part of Transit Month. It is a month-long celebration to um, celebrate the role of transit um, in the Bay Area's recovery with events, rides, and prizes. Um, it has been happening all month long in September, and we've got a lot of other great events coming up, um, including a panel on climate change and transit next week and our Rider First Awards on October 1st. You can learn more at transitmonth.org. Um, and I want to thank everybody on this call who is a member of San Francisco Transit Riders. Um, we would not be here today if not for the support of our members. Um, if you are not a member of San Francisco Transit Riders, please consider joining at um, sftransitriders.org slash donate. Um, members are the lifeblood of our organization and give us the power to make real change for better transit and safer transit here in San Francisco. Um, and before I kick it off um, to our esteemed moderator, Anna, I want to just say a little bit about why transit safety for all matters. Um, rider safety is a key part of a well-run transit system, both for the people who never stopped taking transit during the pandemic and for all of those who we want to encourage to return to transit. Um, but incidents of harassment, crime, and violence on transit vehicles and near transit stops compromise the safety of riders degrade our sense of dignity and dissuade many from using transit at all. Um, it's also important to note that these incidents are not universally felt. Um, three quarters of female riders have experienced harassment or theft on transit. Asian Americans have increased concerns about using transit as we've seen multiple incidents of kind of heinous violence um, against the AAPI community on Muni. Um, undocumented um, riders, black and brown riders and youth riders Safety concerns include fear of crimes committed against them, but also uh, extend to the freedom from harassment from police and security officers. So I am so thankful that we are bringing our, our panelists here together to discuss some of these really critical issues and share their thoughts. And with that, let me introduce Rihanna Tong. Um, Rihanna grew up riding Muni um, and transit throughout the Bay Area, mostly to and from school um, on, on Muni. Now, as she is a member of San Francisco Transit Riders and hopes to use her own experiences and voice to help shift the direction of Bay Area Transit for All. And with that, I'm gonna turn off my video and Rihanna, you can take it away. Okay, I'm in here. Thanks, Zach. Um, hi, everyone. Good evening. I am so excited and honored to moderate tonight's discussion around uh, transit safety for all. This topic is near and dear to my heart. Um, as Zach said, I grew up riding public transit to and from school at a young age, and I really love all the things that it's allowed me to do from traveling to my extracurriculars after school to meeting my friends um, and to now going to work. Uh, I've also had my share of not so good experiences on transit where I was sexually harassed for the first time on a bus going home from middle school, and I had no idea what to do. So I did nothing. Tonight is a look into how we can address a range of transit and transportation safety issues so that hopefully we can all feel safer on transit. So on that note, I will get to introducing our wonderful group of panelists tonight. Uh, first is Lakeisha Wright. Lakeisha is SPIN's Senior Manager for Equity and Streets. She has been leading SPIN's collaboration with the Brown Bike Girl to develop Safety for All, an equity-focused, hands-on safety training geared towards addressing the needs of Black and Brown riders. 
And Keisha has a background in urban planning, policy, and community development. Prior to joining SPIN, Lakeisha also worked at the Institute for Sustainable Communities, the Chicago Transit Authority, the Illinois Network of Charter Schools, and the South Suburban Mayor and Managers Association just south of the city of Chicago. Next is Myrna Melgar. Uh, Myrna was elected District 7 Supervisor in November 2020. As supervisor, she represents District 7's diverse communities, including 40 distinct neighborhoods. Myrna is an urban planner, economic development, and housing policy expert, and has served in city government in several dis different capacities. Myrna formerly worked as the executive director of the Jamestown Community Center, deputy director of the Mission Economic Development Agency, director of home ownership programs at Mayor's Office of Housing during the Newsom administration, and served as president of the City Planning Commission and vice president of the Building Inspection Commission. Next is Halima Barucha. Halima is a Gen Z change maker committed to building a world free of gender-based violence. Halima works as the advocacy director at the Alliance for Girls, where she leads legislative and community advocacy for a girl-led girls policy agenda. She has led the first ever youth-driven community initiative, Not One More Girl, to address gender-based violence on BART. Halima believes in the power of people to make a positive change and is guided by her vision for a community where all girls and women live with dignity and respect. And last but not least, we have Kimberly Burris. Kimberly is the Chief Security Officer of SFMTA, who comes to the Bay Area from Baltimore, Maryland, where she spent more than 20 years in law enforcement with the Baltimore Police Department. With a Master's of Science in Management from Johns Hopkins University and vast experience in crime strategy and crime response, she is a proponent of policing alternatives because it draws from the concerns of the community it helps to better focus police response and cultivates improved relationships. So this is, as Zach said, our esteemed panel. Um, we are so excited to have you all. So thank you for taking the time to join us tonight. So I will kick us off with um, this question that is derived right from the title of this panel, which is, what does transit safety mean to you and why does, this, uh, why does this topic matter to you? So I will work down the list of um, the panelists that I just introduced in order. So can I open it up to Lakeisha for you to answer that? Sure. So it means physical safety to me. I think about like literally getting my body from one space to another when I think of safety. And what it means to me, it's like, I am a regular like transit rider. I chose the place that I live specifically because it was three blocks from the train. Like that was my number one choice when it came to picking a place. So it, I kind of centered everything that I did around it. So again, being able to kind of take that element and keep it within the realm of things that I feel comfortable doing is extremely important as well. Thank you, Lisha. How about let's ask um, Supervisor Melgar the same question. Thank you, uh, Brianna. So I would expand a little bit of what Lakeisha said as she put it, you know, hit it right on the head, um, that uh, sometimes it also means um, sort of uh, psychological and emotional safety. Um, I uh, started writing Muni uh, when my family first immigrated to San Francisco when I was um, 12 years old and I would take the 14 mission to school. Uh, I didn't speak English and it was, uh, you know, like a crash course and everything, but it also gave me so much freedom, right? All of a sudden at, at 12 years old, I had the city at my feet. Um, you know, many years later, uh, when I was a single mom, um, my girls would take Muni to school. And so just the um, idea uh, that some
something could happen if they had interactions on the bus that were problematic, you know, um, it, it definitely <laughs> made me feel like I wasn't doing, you know, what I could to keep them safe as a mom, you know, so uh, a lot of young people experience things in uni that are great, um, because the world is at your feet, you experience everything. And at the same time, uh, it could be psychologically, emotionally damaging if you have interactions that, you know, kind of mess with you, your sense of security. Thank you all for sharing some of your thoughts. Um, at Alliance for Girls, one of the things that we uplift is um, how girls and gender extensive youth define safety. And that is very radically different than how our adults see it. And so our most recent work, Radical Visions of Safety Report, which I'll link in the chat um, that came out, talked about um, some of these components that the other panelists touched on, that safety isn't just about physical safety, but it's also about emotional safety. And this was something that was most referenced by girls and gender extensive youth, you know, the inherent trust that we have with others, our sense of belonging, our ability to form connections, um, and be in a space where we aren't judged, um, as well as spiritual safety and being in a space where we, we feel spiritually safe to um, be who we are. And so working on the Not One More Girl initiative um, over the last two years with community partners and with youth leaders, those were some key things that we, t we heard from youth about wanting to see on transit, wanting to feel comfort and wanting to feel accepted, um, especially from trans youth, you know, not not feeling like someone is staring at you because of your gender identity or harassing you because of your gender identity. Um, and for me personally, I see safety as there is this physical component, but there's also the mental component, you know, the ability to be able to sit down, shoulders down, relax, be able to breathe, um, and also to be able to thrive. You know, I shouldn't have to look over my shoulder or just think about, um, you know, my safety components. I can also just sit on the, on the bar and enjoy my ride or sit on Muni and just enjoy my ride and listen to music and maybe get work done if I want to, but to be able to have those options. Good evening, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. So as the chief security officer of a major transportation agency, I have a heavy load because it's extremely important to me that our system not only feels safe, but it is safe. And so when I think of transit safety, it means providing the optimal riding experience for our customers um, from every aspect of traveling while using public transportation. It's, it's really about understanding what our, our customers how our customers feel unsafe. And that is, that's not always about crime. So it's not about physical safety and it's not always about what happens on our vehicles or in our facilities. Yes, identifying and solving crime related incidents is, is imperative, but it's also about reliable service and the accessibility to service information, knowing how to navigate the system to reduce anxiety having uh, different staff members aboard uh, our vehicles during your transport time, and being able to, to reach out to those staff members for any assistance that you need. Um, it's, it's about con concerns um, that you experience or issues that you experience that disrupt your travel patterns. So knowing that if something does occur on our system, that we have measures in place to immediately address them and, and, and letting people know that certain things will not be tolerated on our system. And that, that's what it means to me. Thank you all for sharing what um, safety, safety on transit means you know, for you and those around you and for the entire you know, city and Bay Area. Um, since Kimberly mentioned you know, working at SFMTA, um, I would be interested in hearing from uh, Supervisor Melgar as someone who does work closely um, with people in District 7 and all around the city, and you probably hear about a lot of people's experiences. Um, I'd be interested in hearing your experience and that of the constituents um, that you serve and their experiences of riding transit and how these have driven your work as supervisor. 
I mean, I have so much to say, but I would give you just like a snippet of something that I care deeply about, and that is the experiences of youth on Muni. So, you know, we were just able to, for the first time, make uh, Muni free for everyone in San Francisco who is under uh, 19 years old. And that was a big thing um, because for years we've heard about about, uh, you know, youth not having enough money for the bus and, you know, the sort of criminalization that happens to youth when they get caught, you know, jumping the turns up. So like we've gone, come a long way to, to make that aspect feel safe for youth. Um, but, you know, there's still a bunch of issues that we haven't resolved. I'd love to hear from Halima because I've, um, you know, long admired the campaign um, that they have done on BART. I think we need to do something like that, um, you know, in, in San Francisco, both on BART and on Muni. I mean, as a woman, I have had my share of experiences, uh, you know, of you know, screwed up stuff on Muni, but for girls, uh, it can be quite damaging, you know, to have those interactions, very traumatic. So I think that's another experience. And I think I, last, I would say uh, for youth, um, you know, I think adults can be terrible to youth sometimes, you know, they can be patronizing and condescending. And I have been on the bus when, you know, uh, field trips full of kids and are on the bus and they're just being normal kids, kind of noisy and adults get very like annoyed at the noise or at the, you know, and, and it's just intolerance, you know, <laughs> of youth. And, and, you know, I think that um, I, I would love it if we had a campaign for that too, you know, just because I think it's so important to be uh, welcoming to youth uh, on our public transportation because we are literally training entire generations of future riders and we want them to feel safe to, to think of the bus as like that freedom you know uh, rather than thinking that that the way they get their freedom is to get a driver's license at age 15 and a half and, and, and do it that way so um, those are the things that that I've heard you know mostly from young people uh, about safety and about about how they wish, you know, uh, things were, were, were better in that respect. And on that note of safety and what it means to youth, I'd like to turn it over to Halima and ask you about the Not One Word Girl campaign that addresses sexual harassment on BART, especially as you know, young girls might experience it. Can you tell us a little bit more about the program and um, how it developed and how it's had an impact. Absolutely. So Not One More Girl is an initiative that was in partnership with Betty Ono, um, which is an arts and cultural strategy center in Oakland, Black Girls Brilliance that serves Black middle school youth and the Unity Council's Latina Mentorship and Achievement Program. Um, and we specifically want to make sure that youth programs um, and artists and cultural strategists were at the table so we could have a very holistic approach to addressing sexual harassment um, with the understanding that it's not just about systems and policies that need to uh, improve, but it's also about the culture that has normalized um, gender-based violence, sexual harassment on our systems. Um, and so we were very intentional about making sure that was part of this work from the very beginning, as well as making sure we were moving beyond the gender binary and um, making sure that trans youth, non-binary youth, gender non-conforming youth, uh, gender queer youth, and any girl-identified youth um, we're involved in this initiative, Start to Finish. And we started this work by listening to young voices and through our Together We Rise research report that came out in August of 2019, um, we were able to identify that this was a, a big crisis that girls and gender expensive youth in the Bay Area were facing um, around public safety, not feeling safe on public transit. And as we know, public transportation is not just about getting from one place to another, it's about our access to education, our access to healthcare, our access to job opportunities, and so much more. And so in order to make sure that our communities can thrive and access the resources they need, it's critical that they have access to safe and just passageways. Um, and so we started this initiative um, through that process and we did town halls in the Bay Area to better understand what solutions community members and youth leaders had um, to address this issue. Um, and once we had compiled that, we had presented this to multiple transit agencies to see if any of them would be able to invest in this and to sign on. And 
BART was the first agency to sign on and say they would be able to move forward with adopting this. And so that what has unfolded over the last two years in working in partnership with BART has been really beautiful. And we've been able to engage um, so many youth. Um, youth actually held 100 paid roles in this initiative. And that was a, another critical component was making sure youth were paid for their work. Um, youth sat at the table with BART's chief communication officer and gave feedback on strategy, on implementation. Um, youth were part of the images that were rolled out on BART's system calling out sexual harassment. They did a lot of the digital uh, components and design. They produced so much content, especially with the pandemic. Um, we knew it was important to make sure there was a digital component. So um, I would definitely go ahead and link some of the work um, so folks can find it. There's a digital swag bag that some of the youth put together that like fun Spotify playlists and other components. Um, and we were also able to work with a youth artist to do a zine that talks about um, the resources that are available through BART in a more accessible and engaging way. But there's so many changes that we were able to make through that, and I can get into that a bit later. Thanks, Salima. And I've seen a bunch of the um, posters on BART so, and at the BART station, so if anyone hasn't seen them, just keep your eyes peeled at the BART stations. It's really cool to see um, these um, campaign posters that the youth have developed as part of the program. Um, on that note, I understand that the not one, part of the Not One More Girl campaign is you know, looking at alternatives to the traditional policing response um, to um, safety on transit. Um, so I wanted to ask Kimberly, um, SFMTA has reorganized the fair inspection program to focus on compliance rather than enforcement. Can you share a little bit more about these changes um, and why they were made and any results so far? Sure, great question. There is such a balance to strike when you're trying to secure a transportation system without making it feel like it's being occupied. And across the country, agencies are struggling to to toe the line. Um, and so in August of 2020, um, what we did was move our fair inspection program from an enforcement uh, program model to a compliance model. And that was done in a way for us to strike that balance. Um, and some of the things that we looked at was we wanted to make sure that our program was aligned and our production was aligned with the agency's value that's deep rooted in respect, right? And we wanted to also improve the, improve the relationship of our fair inspectors with our, our riders. And we, we wanted to uh, create a, a thriving riding experience. We wanted it to be less interruptive and disruptive when you're just getting off of work or coming from school and you just want to be able to sit down and enjoy your ride to get where you're going. Um, and, and, and the last thing we wanted to do is be able to increase our fare revenue by providing customers the ability to comply um, with our fare policies. And so some of the things that we looked at was um, we looked at how we showed up every day, right? How we interacted with our ridership. And so what we decided to do was relax our look um, because our, our uniforms looked much like SFPD. And so some riders were a bit confused um, and we wanted our look to complement our scope and our new approach. And, and, and what we did was change our, our inspection style. So we, we felt like it would be better for us to already be on our vehicles and set a tone. And so as our riders came onto the vehicles, they would be more invited as opposed to getting on the coaches and the vehicles and announcing an overall inspection and interrupting your ride. And so that as you enter the vehicle, you would be asked to make sure you uh, tag your your, your um, tag and, and, and pay as you enter the vehicle. And so we've only been doing it now for a year. So we don't have uh, the anal um, analytical information to share with you. Um, but some of the things that we are seeing is we are seeing a reduction in our customer service complaints against our fare inspectors. So we do see that we are trending in the right direction. And we are seeing, although slowly uh, recovering due to the pandemic, we are seeing an increase in the fare uh, box. And so we know that this approach um, has a, a benefit that uh, in time, 
will have an overall uh, benefit. Thank you. Um, I wanted to revisit something that Supervisor Melgar mentioned earlier about how youth um, experience transit and how you know they're perceived and how they're treated. Um, this is a question for Lakeisha um, about SPIN's Safety for All program, uh, which is geared toward the needs of black and brown riders. You know, I would be interested in knowing what are some of the safety concerns um, that come from using bike share and how do these compare to how black and brown riders may experience it? So thinking about the different experiences of people who use bike share Oh, and also, sorry, a follow-up question to that was, how would how did the um, safety for all training um, specifically address these concerns of black and brown riders? Sure, so the safety issues that black and brown riders usually have are exacerbated. They're usually compounded onto other things. And a lot of those things are also things that are somewhat invisible. So we use the example of like putting a helmet on your hair. It can be stopped usually at the door by someone saying like, okay, black women don't wanna mess up their hair. They spend a lot of time and money and things like that on their hair. That's actually typically not the case. The case may be that a black woman is choosing one safety over another. Like if I had on a helmet, I walked into a store and my hair is messed up. That may mean that I may get followed through that store. I may get harassed in that store. I may you know, not be able to comfortably do what I need to do because someone's staring at me like I don't belong, I don't look a certain way. So then maybe that person could choose to not wear a helmet to take that safety at the store over their safety on a bike or a scooter instead. So it's taking those type of things that these choices that black and brown people make are typically something that is, again, kind of weighing issues and things like that. So we developed this program to not only just acknowledge that these issues exist for black and brown people with wearing helmets, navigating roads that may not be the highest quality, um, police enforcement and things like that, and saying that we're going to give you tools in the short term to deal with those, but also a part of the training is looking at ways that people can advocate for the things that they need so that, okay, we'll tell you, this is how you navigate a street without bus lanes or bike lanes or something like that. But then also taking that and saying, all right, let's now approach your city council, let's approach your neighborhood, let's approach your alderman or someone else in charge to say, this is why this community needs this. We have this extra option, we need this, now like a way to use that option as well and taking those tools and turning people in, again out of just being rioters but being advocates for themselves as well and then some of the other ways of addressing it too we're just looking at what's being told to us we know that the programs that we develop are not final we're not saying that we're presenting this program it's going to do great things even though we hope it does uh, but that's it. As we hear things, we want to be able to add on to this and to switch it around and to address new issues and to maybe switch old issues and things like that as they come and go. So it's more of a dynamic safety program than it is just saying like, all right, we're doing a great job by acknowledging, but again, we're doing a great job by trying to figure out what's next as well. Thank you. And the, uh, the helmet example that you provided earlier on was a great example of what Zach had mentioned earlier in the introduction, which is the safety um, issues that people experience range from person to person. Um, so it's, it's nice to be able to understand how other people um, how everyone is experiencing and for us to be able to share that on this platform. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah, and um, just throwing it out there too, but like uh, Halima said too, you have a completely different set of things that they're processing and working through and doing as well so that we have to take that into account that their lives can reflect their safety choices as well. Yeah, that's a, that's a great actually segue to my next question, which is, um, Mahalima had mentioned how transit 
not only affects or transit safety is not just physical, but also mental. And it can impact you beyond just your experience riding on um, transit or on a bike share or on BART. Um, so my next question actually for all the panelists is, what is your understanding? What is your understanding of how transit safety can um, impact people's lives beyond just riding on transit? And I will, can we just work backwards on this list? So I'll start with Kimberly. Sure. Um, it has a huge impact. Um, if I don't feel safe, it governs my decisions, it alters my routine, um, and that has an, a multitude of implications. Um, and so because we know that transit is, is used by uh, different riders for different reasons, um, my choice not to use transit because of the safety issue impact could impact my health as I, I try to find ways alternative ways to my doctor's appointments or to my uh, my to, to get my medication um, that then segues into the impacts financial impacts implications um, if I choose to use an alternate route uh, like car sharing um, that that can be a heavy lift financially um, it we use transit to get to and from workplaces and from school. So it has um, implications on job retention if I feel unsafe and in transit is, is not my, my reliable and is not my choice of uh, travel. So I think it has huge implications. Thanks, and going backwards, I'll, uh, I think Halima would be next. Yes, I would agree with a lot of what Kimberly shared. And for a lot of you, this might mean missing school. It might mean missing doctor's appointments. Um, we heard from one youth that they had to change and find a new job and leave a job that they really loved because it was uh, a place where they had to go during the night and take public transit and they really didn't feel safe doing that. Um, people even having to move to different locations so that they can feel safer and access things more easier if they, if they don't feel comfortable using public transit. So it can certainly affect a lot of key life decisions and um, and shape those experiences. And you know, similar to what um, Supervisor Melgo said earlier, you know, this is also uh, should be a positive experience for you, right? This is something that you feel can okay, I have my own independence? I can go places, and you're really missing out on that experience because you weren't able to ride the system because you didn't feel safe and. Um, because of the safety concerns. So I, I think there's so much that people ultimately miss out on. And, um, you know, in, in particular, just wanted to highlight the fact that this is uh, not just about fun, but it's about educational and economic opportunity and healthcare. And we don't want anyone to ever have to make those really tough decisions um, because they didn't feel safe um, using public transit. Thank you for that. Um, and moving on up my list, I would like to ask uh, Supervisor Melgar the same question. Um, how, how do you think the safety on transit impacts people beyond just our transit experiences? Um, so I'm gonna um, sort of highlight the positive uh, side of this question um, because I mean, the truth is, you know, um, you remember the bummer experiences, you know, like, in, and they don't, they're not as frequent, you know, in the monotony of every day keep taking the bus, but that one experience or a couple of experience can really scar you and that, that that's what you talk about, you know, uh, but, but if I'm honest about it, I have had such great experiences of community and love on the bus. Um, and that also like is, is about you know, safety and community. And uh, I've got to say, I've had soulful conversations with people. I've, you know, I'm an extrovert, I'm a politician. So I, you know, I do talk to everybody, but I've gotten to know people on the bus. You know, uh, when I worked in the mission, I hung out with the kids on the bus and they told me what they were doing during the day. I uh, was able to sit to the lady, you know, selling tamales and, you know, learn her recipe. And, you know, I've had uh, such great experiences experiences that build my sense of being part of the community of belonging to you know people and to um you know getting to know other humans and how they are 
going through this world and writing our transportation system with me um, that, you know, I also think that that is a really important feature of how we all live together in this like seven by seven square miles, right? We are all sharing the system and getting around, getting to work, getting our kids to school and talking to each other and being together on the bus. And I think that that is really important uh, and uh, an important part of how we build community. That's amazing. I love that you put a positive um, spin. I definitely would agree that transit can bring so much to our world. Um, I would also like to ask Lakeisha if there's anything else that you would want to add to that um, about you know, experiences on transit. Yeah, sure. Everything that everyone said, I couldn't agree more with. But jumping off of what Supervisor Melgar said, like we've seen the effects of isolation in a compacted way with COVID-19. But imagine that broader and longer with people not being able to use transit to see their friends. I think back to like my own personal experience of not being able to see my friends because they live far away, but I could have taken transit, but I chose not to, again, for personal safety when I was young. So then it became, okay, let's all navigate how do we get here? Oh, I have to drive, but now there's nowhere to park. I guess I'm just not going to go. So you start to see yourself doing more and more of that. Like, I guess I won't or I can't. And that's the that's on the lowest level of that. Because again, that same thing starts happening when you're looking at jobs. Maybe that job's not for me when it could be a high paying, great job that could change your life. Or even thinking too, like, oh, I want to continue to go to a church that maybe I moved away from. Maybe not. It's too much of a hassle. So without transit, you start to just like, so just go into yourself and just not really have that outside relationships that like Supervisor Melgar mentioned, like those things are so incredibly impactful on your life whether you realize it or not. And hopefully I think we all do again, given the times, but um, yeah, just the little things start to compile. And you know, making our experiences on transit positive, it can involve so many people and um, communities around us, um, other transit riders. Um, it could also involve uh, a lot of partnerships between um, people making change, right? So I understand that um, Halima, you, the Not One More Girl campaign, you all had to um, work very closely with BARD and you also worked with um, the Betty Ono Center. Um, so I'd be curious for um, Lakeisha specifically for how SPIN and Bike Share has partnered with other programs with people to ensure um, safety for users um, and I would like to ask the other panelists also so for some you know, key partnerships that you think would be crucial to helping us make our transit systems a safer place. Um, but let's start with Lakeisha. Sure. So for our program specifically, we partnered with Brown Bike Girl, who is a young lady out of New York who started her entire bike share advocacy out of the fact that she would ride around and not see anyone else who looked like her and realize that messaging towards bike share, scooter share, things like that are all not geared towards her. So she became a great partner in thinking through what are, how did you feel? What are the things you looked at? What are some other things you're hearing in the community as well? But on top of that, we also look towards partnering with non-transportation advocates. I know it's kind of sounds strange being in transportation, but we find that the people most impacted by transportation are not always necessarily the people with transportation in their name or transportation as their focus, like housing agencies or even a library or anyone else in the community where they either need to get people to or from a spot are usually our biggest advocates and people with the best solutions because they're on the ground talking to people who need to do things and need to get to those things that they need to do. So we're trying to partner again, just more broadly and more people who, again, may not even see themselves as transportation advocates, but very truly are. And Halima, I understand that the Not One More Girl campaign, um, the partnerships are very crucial as far as you know, reaching 
reaching people and uh, building trust. Can you share more about the importance there? Yes, absolutely. One of the key takeaways that we learned from this initiative and that we've um, always known is that working with community organizations, people on the ground, advocates, survivors, people with lived experiences um, is the way to go. And I think that was a huge lesson learned um, for BART as well, having worked with um, multiple community partners, youth organizations, artists, working with Alliance for Girls, um, really understanding the importance of working together, um, as well as making sure this work was informed by uh, community-led research and data. Um, and those were some really key components. And one of the first things that we did um, when BART said they wanted to move forward with this um, partnership was host a um, community listening space. So the general manager, um, a lot of their board members, their senior staff uh, came together and they met us where we were at, at Betty Ono. And we had you know, youth leaders, community organizations come and talk candidly about their experience on transit and what they wanted uh, BART to do in terms of changes. And so that was like a great way for, for BART to be able to show up in that space and show their commitment. And for so many youth, it was a transformative experience to be part of that initiative when it was just a conversation and then to see it actually happen. Um, and for them, it also built so much trust with the transit agency, knowing that this agency really cared about what they had to say, took them seriously, paid them for their time and expertise and actually implemented their ideas. So I know for a lot of them, they were, some of them were even surprised. They're like, you know, we didn't think anything was going to come out of this conversation. But now to see two years later that this actually, um, you know, became something was just amazing for them. Uh, and I'm sure this is going to be something that they'll get to remember for the rest of their life as something that they were part of. Um, and I think them having ownership in the process was really key. And I'll just share a little bit of the outcomes that came out of this initiative, um, which were, were many. Um, and through this process, um, we were actually able to make sure that youth were hired to serve on the hiring panel for BART's unarmed positions. So they served on the hiring panel for the transit ambassador and the crisis intervention specialist role, um, you know, really working to make sure there are non-police unarmed options for transit riders to be able to call on for help. Um, we also worked with the police chief to make a new BART watch reporting category. It's titled Unwanted Verbal and Nonverbal Sexual Harassment. Um, and, and this was a little bit tricky because um, sexual harassment isn't included in the penal code per se. So it's not technically against the law, some aspects of it. And so um, it was just important to make that disting distinguishment to riders, but also um, internally to remember that even if it's not against the law, it's still not okay. And we still want to track these occurrences and prevent these occurrences from happening. Um, Bart also did a really, really critical step. And it was something that I think any transit agency can do, which was to start tracking sexual harassment occurrences on their system. Um, when we first approached Bart, they, um, and we asked them for data, they, they didn't have any, and it's because they weren't tracking this. So over the last couple of quarters, Bart has been asking this question on their um, passenger environment survey to find out um, if riders have experienced sexual harassment in the last six months. It's a yes or no question. Um, the most recent data showed that 12% of riders had experienced sexual harassment, and they're also going to be adding this to their customer satisfaction survey so we can get further detail, um, not just a yes or no, but also what type of incident, what station, what time, uh, demographics of the person who experienced harassment so we can create more targeted and effective solutions. Um, and then one of the other things that we did was we spent almost two years creating this, but having a very thorough and intentional website that outlines how to get help if you experience or witness sexual harassment. Many transit agencies are lacking this. It's a very simple op, you know, very simple thing that anyone can do, but, you know, clearly outlining, you know, if you get help through BART police, what are your rights? What can you expect? If you're a minor, can you have a parent with you? That kind of stuff, you know, after you report something, what's the follow up? Um, if I don't want to report to police, who can I go to? Um, making sure all that's clearly outlined. So that is something that we were able to put on this website page in detail, um, you know, including what is in the penal code, what is not in the penal code, defining key terms like gender-based violence, sexual harassment. Um, and then we also did a bystander intervention training video that I would encourage anyone on this call to watch. It's a three-minute video that talks about how to intervene safely um, if you see sexual harassment. Um, and this is something that all BART employees are going to be watching as a part of their regular training, including the general manager. Um, what was really great, too, was that a lot of station agents felt um, really engaged and interested and were very supportive of helping to move this forward. So they're actually going to be adding a component 
that is filmed by, um, you know, just a perspective from station agents to hear from them about intervention as well, because we also know this, is, this isn't just about writers, it's also about the staff who uh, work on the front lines that a lot of them do experience harassment of different forms and violence. And so um, they were very interested in supporting this initiative. Um, and then we rolled out over 300 posters all over BART. So there's 300 inside the cars and 50 on different station platforms. Um, we're trying to see if we can keep some of these up permanently just to call out sexual harassment and you know really change that culture that has normalized this behavior. Um, and those posters were designed by uh, artist Nisha Sati um, with Betty Ono and was really driven by youth. So even the slogans that were created, it was, uh, decided by youth who we were working with from Black Girls Brilliance and Unity Council. Um, we also worked to update the writer code of conduct. So now there's going to be a, a, a line item on every BART card that says sexual harassment is prohibited. Um, and, you know, again, it's on the penal code. So this, is, oh, this will not result in like police arrest, which we're grateful for because we don't want to advocate for additional police. But it does mean a writer can be ejected for sexually harassing another passenger. Um, which does make a statement. And also it just puts that verbally in every single car that this is not tolerated. Um, and so those were just an overview of uh, a number of things we are able to do. Um, and BART is committed to working on a phase two. So we're working with them and our community partners are working to think about what we can do in terms of next steps, certainly thinking about you know, long-term having a training that can be permanent for all employees on gender-based violence prevention. You know, Currently we have the human trafficking training through our state bill but wanting to make sure gender-based violence more thoroughly and sexual harassment is more specifically covered in the scope of training. Um, I would love, you know, if all transit agencies had a survivor advocate hired on the team instead of having to go to county survivor advocates so someone can really be there on site when there are gender-based violence calls and be able to bring a tra trauma-informed approach. Um, and again, making sure that youth are part of the process. So in the long run, we know when we're creating a new station, when we're renovating the station, let's make sure we're talking to girls and gender expansive youth about what their ideas are. And I know when we had our town halls, um, youth had some wonderful ideas and even drew up some images of what they imagined as like a safe waiting area if they're waiting to get picked up by their parent or transferred to another uh, system or you know get their Uber or Lyft, but they all had really great ideas of what a safe waiting area could look like. So even thinking of the physical infrastructure, the engineering, the architecture and the design of spaces, you know, when we talk about safety. So those are, um, you know, some things that we've done and uh, a little bit of where we're planning to go. Thanks, Salima. You, um, what an amazing list of things that you have done. Um, and you brought up a couple of things that I want to follow up on. One was um, starting with really understanding how writers are um, experiencing transit and collecting the data and also bringing up that youth have ideas on how they want to, um, how, what would make them feel safer. Um, so this question is directed at Kimberly. Um, we now understand that transit safety can mean many things for different people. Um, what is SFMTA doing to understand how its spectrums of riders experience transit and respond to make them feel safe? Yeah, it's a great question. So we, we have uh, done a lot in this area, but we are enhancing um, our, uh, our, our uh, how we engage in this area um, because um, we work with a lot of partners. We work with community organizations. We work very closely with our partner uh, agencies like BART because we share the same issues and some of the same ridership. Um, one of the things that we have done is we have added and implemented our youth advisory board so that we could lift those voices um, so that we make decisions about certain groups with that group's involvement. Um, we know that we can't uh, have a transit for all if we don't understand the concerns of the individual groups that rely on our public transportation. And so some of the things that we actually look at um, is coming up with different ways to engage our public outside of our traditional um, engagement. And so we're looking to doing more focus groups. We're looking to work directly with specific groups um, to find out how, in fact, uh, 
the differences between the traveling of uh, women and, and young girls um, in our AAPI community. What does that look like? Because we, we can't address what we don't know. Um, and so some of the concerns that we have is how to best collect the data so that we can make informed decisions um, so that we can provide a, a transit transportation um, agency that is safe and is truly for, for all. Thank you. Um, so we've, we've kind of heard from, you know, the part, uh, the, the agencies that actually are um, delivering transit, right? We have SPIN, we have um, BART and um, SFMTA. Um, I'd like to hear from Supervisor Melgar, someone who can work um, legislatively and, um, you know, bringing forth things through law. Uh, what are some of the the challenges that you've had with um, making transit safer or uh, moving forward some of these transit safety measures and maybe some of the um, things that you're looking forward to in the future that you're hoping to do through um, your role as supervisor? Uh, thank you so much for that question. You know, um, one aspect of safety that we haven't quite talked about yet, and I, and I sort of want to explore with that question, um, is the relationship that um, transportation has to the different communities, um, identity and sense of security culturally, you know, uh, within the city. So, um, you know, how important the 30 Stockton is to Chinatown or for the 14 mission bus to, you know, the mission and or 15 to Bayview. And, you know, um, part of that sense of uh, safety for people who ride it is like, this is the bus I take to get back home and it's gonna all be full of my people and it's gonna run consistently, you know, and get me to where I need to go at, to and from work. And I feel like sometimes uh, it, it's not an operations issue, but a planning issue that we don't engage enough with communities when we make uh, changes or um, there are schedule changes or changes to the bus itself or to the service or to the operation. It just really messes with the sense of security uh, and safety that communities have that depend on that transportation. So I'll give you, uh, you know, and, and that happens in the good and the bad, right? And But one example that I remember is when they put the, the, the red lanes, you know, on Mission Street. And I remember coming out that first uh, day after the red lanes went down and people were standing on the corner of Mission and 24th Street, literally screaming <laughs> at the bus because, you know, the cars had to like turn right for the first time. And uh, the folks, you know, at the MTA who to, um, you know, like they meant to, to cut down um, the time for the 14 mission, which is a very well trans traveled line and, and nearly always uh, very crowded, um, you know, uh, like for, forgot a couple things. One is to really engage with the merchants, you know, and to talk to the community about the traffic patterns, but they also forgot about the low riders, right? And the low riders use Mission Street to get from 24th Street out to Embarcadero. Um, and it is such an important important part of like the OG culture of the mission, but like, you know, like have, had there been a community engagement, I think that whole process would have just gone much more smoothly. <laughs> and so that is just one example that I think that, you know, as a, as a legislator, as a decision maker, um, also, uh, you know, just just being the representative for a lot of communities. I hope that in our long term planning uh, for transportation and for the operations of our system, we are uh, communicating with communities uh, much more closely because as um, you know, transportation is important uh, also because of the housing costs in San Francisco and the constant displacement and gentrification of communities of color and low income people. It's super important that we, um, you know, support communities and their sense of safety when it comes to transit. Thanks for sharing that, Marie. Um, interesting to hear from the legislative point of view and your experiences there. Um, this question was actually directed toward Halima, but I would love to open it up to all of the panelists to share 
Um, the original question was, how do you see the Not One More Girl campaign being a catalyst for positive change in Bay Area transit? But if we think about you know, transit safety in general for everyone, whether it's bike share or on uni or on BART, um, I'd like to just ask you, how can it be better when we improve um, transit safety for everyone? Uh, so I will um, go down the list again. Well, uh, let's start with Lakeisha. Yeah, I think because they're all connected, like one can't survive without the other. It's so, I'm trying to think of a better way of putting it. Um, yeah, I just think like, and I'm thinking to myself too. I'm honestly like trying to like think too about just all the times and just thinking about the program. Like it's just so strong <laughs> that I'm like, why was this not around when I was a regular writer and wasn't working from home? Like this would have been incredible. And even thinking back to my youth, but even though going back to bike share and things like that, that that level of safety isn't considered. And also too, if people aren't able to use like bike share and scooter share and things like that as their first mile and last mile option to transit, because they're like, well, this is a waste. I'm not going to do it. Things like that, that I think it's like incredibly important. And I think to just, even if you're a person who identifies as male and you're like, well, that's a woman's problem or something like that this program could bring so much awareness to what's going on and how people feel. And that, again, maybe if you have your blinders on to harassment, that maybe your eyes are open now to it. Thank you. Um, okay, and next I will ask uh, Supervisor Melgar the same question. How can, what do we have to look forward to with uh, safer transit? So, you know, there are several things that I am looking forward to uh, as we improve our transit infrastructure, which I'm uh, really into uh, these days. Um, so uh, one of the things that, um, that I would really like is to incorporate multimodal uh, trips, uh, just as Lakeisha was talking about, making it easier for people to ride scooters and bikes to the bus and then be able to get, you know, to get on and transfer um, or, you know, lift things safely, not have to wait for the one elevator or the no elevator that's broken in order to get in your bike into the bar car. Um, so uh, thinking through, like, the multimodal connections is really important. The other thing that I look forward to is improving the uh, experience for riders who have physical disabilities. I am very sensitive when I see people who just have struggle so much to get on the bus because we have, you know, really old lifts, you know, and then the other folks on the bus, you know, roll their eyes and make it uncomfortable for people who are getting on because it's shaved, you know, a couple seconds from your, you know, so, you know, all of those things, I think if we invested in our infrastructure, we could make it, you know, safer, more comfortable, more welcoming for people, you know, all kinds of people. Uh, but I'm particularly interested in making it for people with disabilities, because I do think that once it works for the people who um, can have the, the, the uh, worst time getting around, then of course, it's going to work for everyone. Thank you. Um, same question, uh, what can we look forward to maybe with ex your experiences on uh, SFMTA um, for Kimberly? Sure, um, and so the no, no One More Girl campaign is, is definitely the, a huge catalyst for change. We had the opportunity of uh, meeting with Halima who is dynamic and fearless in her approach to this. Um, and uh, some representatives from the Department of the Status of Women. Um, and right at the onset of our meetings and conversations, we got hit with the pandemic. So we got a little side rail, but um, that did not stop us from doing a little more research, exploring uh, partnerships with, with uh, uh, universities to advance in this area um, and looking at other community groups 
groups to partner with to, to advance in this area as well. But the other thing it, it does is it not only just focuses on uh, how women travel, but understanding that if we do want to make transit safe for all, we have to do the same for all groups, understanding how all groups travel and what the needs are for those groups so that we can make informed decisions um, and make transit safe for everyone so that we, we as a community can come together um, using transportation as, as, as the catalyst to bring us all together. Thank you for sharing that. Um, it is great to hear all the momentum and I think all the commitment from everyone here to create safer and just passageways for our community. I think that is so important. You know, transit is a lifeline. And um, I think one of the big things that I'm going to continue to look forward to is seeing girls and gender extensive youth, seeing a youth and gender equity lens at the core of how we see safety and security, right? It's not an add-on, it's not something extra, but it's really the core of how we need to see safety and security. Um, and, and, you know, just remembering that this system is a legacy for our generation, right? This is something that girls and gender extensive youth are gonna be writing long into the future. And we want to encourage them to write and want to make sure they feel safe writing and they remember that this is their system too. So I really look forward to that near future. Um, and I remember when we had our press conference for the Not One More Girl uh, initiative, um, I remember just talking to some of the other youth leaders there and all of us were just saying that, you know, we never thought this would happen while we were still young. You know, we thought we'll be like, oh, ladies, and we'll see some changes happening. But to, to see it while you're still young and to be able to take advantage of that, that's just incredible. So I look forward to more, um, more and, and seeing more agencies joining onto this and starting to track sexual harassment occurrences, starting to do trainings for their employees on gender-based violence prevention, um, and really taking a very strong and aggressive stance to address this issue. It's really amazing to hear from you all about your positive, um, bright futures for transit. Uh, before I open it up, uh, we do have a couple questions from people who joined. Um, I did want to close out my questions to you all with a call to action. Um, so the question is, what can everyday transit riders do to ensure a safer, a safer transit system for all? Um, so maybe let's work backwards. So Kimberly? Sure. To ensure a, a safer transit uh, transportation system, I would say that um, our riders do do a lot already, right? And so now it's time for us to do our part. But the one thing that I would, would share is to be alert, um, but always be kind to one another. It's amazing to see how the lack of communication can create such an issue that could be really small, but escalate into something something much larger. So I would say be alert and, and stay kind to one another. You know, uh, how about Halima? I would say um, for all riders and for everyone, you know, if you're riding public transit and you see sexual harassment, intervene. Um, and for everyone who is listening to watch the three minute bystander intervention training video on BART's YouTube um, so that you can get familiar with the steps. Thank you. And Supervisor Melgar? Um, I, I think Kimberly and Halima said everything that I would say. Uh, if you see someone messing with somebody, intervene, yes. And then also be kind to one another and respectful. So absolutely, thank you. And, oh, yes. I also agree with all of that as well. And I also think too, of just being aware that everyone has a different journey to get to where they are and that people have experiences and things like that that come up and can trigger them and may change in the way they perceive something and just being acutely aware that that's happening and also to that everyone again in terms of like what happened to them something could have happened five minutes ago something could have happened years ago that these are all things that people are experiencing dealing with navigating and to be kind. And again, if you see something, say something. And the worst thing you can do in the situation is just have to say, oops, I was wrong, instead of saying, well, I don't wanna intervene because I don't know what's happening right there. Just step up 
and just say like, again, if it's not something, just smile, nod it off and do it again a million times if it means you saved one person. Thank you, that's all very helpful. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna um, go down this list of audience questions. The first one is, in your experience, how much do perceptions of safety factor into the walk to transit as opposed to just safety on board transit? And what can be done to ensure that safety is more prominently factored into the design of the transit network itself? Oh, I really love that question. I think there's research from the Mineta Transit Institute about this, but um, you know those couple of blocks that you have to walk to get from your initial place to the transit and then you know, that last mile, um, so to speak, that is also an area where people do face harassment. Um, one of the things that we were exploring when we first started this initiative was, you know, partnerships with uh, business districts, partnerships with um, people who are working kind of on the streets, who can also intervene, who can give resources, um, and also partnering with bus shelters, partnering with, um, and I know those, a lot of those are owned by like Clear Channel and like other ad agencies, but you know, how can we make those spaces safer and better resource? So if people are waiting for their bus or people are walking or waiting near that area, um, we can create safety measures. So I think that is certainly a place that needs attention and, and care. And, you know, even thinking of something as simple as lighting, but you know, that's something that cities control. And so going city by city is very tough, but if there's some larger agency or, or system that can put in place legislation that ask all cities you know, to be mindful of lighting around those areas, be mindful of staff around those areas. I think that can make a huge difference. Okay, the next question is, uh, is there any data from San Francisco that fare inspection leads to an increase in revenue and how can we ensure fare enforcement is applied equally or equitably? Sure, so because the program is still fairly new, we don't have um, all the data that we need to do a proper analysis, um, but I hope to have that information soon to share with everyone. Um, but what we do see anecdotally is because our fare inspectors are out there and the way that we deploy them, um, we do see an increase in the fare box revenue, um, a progressive increase in the fare box revenue. That Now that doesn't mean by any stretch of the imagination that we are where we are pre-pandemic, but we do see a progressive increase. In terms of how we deploy them and to make sure that the disbursement is equal, um, we do a 30-day calendar where we deploy our fare inspectors to every line, but our lines are actually um, graded, so to speak, so that lines with heavier concentrations, such as ridership, evasion uh, rates, or uh, security incidents are prioritized um, as we cycle through that calendar month. And so every line is, is deployed to um, based on and, and right based on those three things. And so no one one area is or line is getting more touched than, than the other because it's very important for us to ensure that if we are, let's say deployed to the 14, which is, is a well-traveled line that we're also deploying to the, the one California. And so every day we make sure that we have what we call a high line and a low line so that there is an even disbursement. This is very interesting. Um, and the next question is when talking about, when talking to writers about safety, I have heard some variant of SFMTA needs to remove the homeless many times. Does the panel have any suggestions for how to move the conversation beyond, beyond a more reductionist approach? I would just add to this. Um, I, I think that uh, approach that I would like to see moving forward, it, it's one thing for um, MTA to come up with programs and, and policies and initiatives to address certain issues. But I, I think it should be more of, of a collective effort because a lot of what the concerns are don't necessarily 
are, are not always isolated to what's occurring on our system or necessarily in our facilities. And so to that regard, I would like to see us come together as a city agency family and make sure that all of our initiatives align with one another so that if MTA is putting something in place. Um, another agency looks at what they're putting into place to see how they can support that and how we can move forward as a city to address some of the larger issues that we have that trickle down to our transportation system. So I'd like to address that, Rihanna, if I could. Uh, so just to build on what uh, Kimberly was saying, you know, that question, um, the way that it's worded, it's a little bit problematic, right? Because I think that what we what we mean to say is, you know, we want to remove people who are engaging in specific behaviors. I don't want to like, you know, cast an aspersion to all folks who happen to be without a house to say that they're problematic on the bus uh, in San Francisco Unified. A school district alone, we have 3000 kids uh, currently who are homeless, like fit the definition of homeless. So what we're talking about is folks who perhaps are on the bus, um, you know, in having either a mental health crisis or some kind of um, behavior that bothers others on the bus. And so, you know, to, to that specific uh, issue, I think Kimberly is right. I would like to see uh, a, a way to have, you know, um, an ambassador type program, which the MTA already has, but you know, with the training and resources uh, that can uh, interact and collaborate with a hot team or with you know folks who can um, hook people up to uh, services through mental health SF or you know substance use um, you know uh, prevention or you know other things that are uh, already offered through our city, um, so that people don't fall through the cracks, so that they their behavior is address when they um, come into contact with somebody who can help them. So I um, I will be reaching out to you, Kimberly, because I think that we, we can, uh, you know, do something that way. But I just want to, uh, you know, just underscore that folks who are houseless in San Francisco also have the right to ride our transit system, you know, so that's not the issue. The issue is, uh, you know, problematic behavior on the bus, and that's what we need to address. I love that you said you would be reaching out to Kimberly because this is um, just an example of the amazing connections that can be made and hopefully uh, we can move forward and improve our sense of safety on transit with everyone um, and by partnering. So the last question uh, that came from the audience is what does it mean to you all to ensure safety that is centered around seniors, people with disabilities, and mothers and families. I can jump in with this one because I feel like given that we're bike share and scooter share that it, it's a misperception that we're only focused on people who are gonna ride a bike or a scooter, but we take just as much into making sure that our service is not inconvenient for those who may have mobility issues or any other class of people as well who may consider themselves to not be a rider, like seniors or people, again, like that. But um, we also wanna make sure too with our services that we're taking our money and what we're doing for streets and equity and making sure that that's applied to making sure like streets are great for everyone. So that, okay, maybe, you know, people are thinking we're going to adjust the curb or something like that for scooters for ease of use, but really we're actually helping wheelchairs. We're helping again with those who may be walking with a cane or something like that and making sure that anything that we do is for everyone on the street. And again, even looking to transit agencies and other agencies as well throughout the city to make sure that what we're doing is we're hoping to fulfill either an equity goal or something else that's um, on the ground at the same time. So again, it's really just understanding that our reach affects everyone. And if it doesn't, we're not being equitable. Like that's the only way to achieve true equity is to make sure that every single person, user or not, whether they pay full price or not, whether they use a scooter every day or not, feels the same sense of ownership in the work that we do and the impact that we have in order to, again, achieve our full goal.
Thanks, Lakeisha. Uh, we did, this is, uh, didn't come in as a question, but we did have a comment in the chat that I did wanna um, bring up to make sure the panelists um, know about it. And the comment is, uh, don't forget to mention or talk about ca taxi cabs and their role in the uh, public transit system. Um, yeah, so that is um, the first comment. And the next one is that the, SF the SFCTA needs to push for the use of clipper cards as payment for taxi cab fares and subsidies for the late night workers to ride in taxi, cab taxi cabs for the last mile. Um, so I just wanted to lift that up um, for the panelists to, to be aware. Okay. Um, so that concludes the question and Q and A. Um, I really wanna thank the panelists for um, joining in and speaking. I know I went a little bit, uh, I diverged from the planned questions a little bit. Um, so thank you for <laughs> answering along. I really appreciate you and um, hope to be able to talk to you more about safety um, in the future. Thank you for mm -hmm. having us and really great to meet everyone. Thank you. It was a pleasure to be uh, a part of this, this uh, panel. So thank you. You all are awesome. And so I would be remiss in not thanking Rihanna for her amazing moderating tonight. Um, and also for thanking SPIN, who is a Transit Month sponsor and helped put this panel together. Um, so we would not be having these amazing discussions without them. Um, and just one more plug, it is Transit Month. Um, Sue Fraser Melgar has been doing a wonderful job writing transit and posting on transit. We love it. Um, we've got a lot more events coming up this month. You can go to transitmonth.org to learn more about that um, and our work to lift up riders and ensure we have transit safety for all. So thank you all for your time tonight um, and we hope to see you on transit. Thank you. Oh, I, sorry, I have one more thing. We need a picture for the panelists. Oh. Um, that has been there, so we're gonna do that right now. Um, we might've lost Mirna already. Um, so I'm gonna do that very quickly. Everybody smile on three. One, two, three. Perfect. Thank you all and uh, have a great night. Bye.